Welcome, Oscar fans! The 2020 Academy Awards were full of surprises, but nothing was more surprising or exciting as watching tonight's movie take home the award for Best Picture. Because we watched Charles Band's 1982 film Parasite tonight on B uh, Chris, Movie! Chris, we it's not, that's not the right movie. It's not the right no. movie. Yeah, not that one. Welcome to the crossroads of camp, the bastion of the bazaar, the place where low budgets meet high praise. Yes, it's B Movie Mania. And now, B Movie Maniacs, here are your hosts, the cream of the crap, the connoisseurs of cult, your cinematic creepy uncle, Paul Brooks, Mike Hayes, Jason Holmes, and Crazy Chris Hudson. Wait, did you actually pick the Parasite movie that won Best Picture? Because we all watched something else, I think. I watched something else. Didn't, didn't we already do this bit for the teaser? Wait. I'm so confused. Should we have watched the Academy Award winning film Parasite? Yes, by Charles Band from 1982. Hudson, you're mixing a bunch of shit up in your head. The movie Parasite did win the Oscars this year, Best Picture, amongst other awards. There's a Charles Band, but Charles Band did not direct that one. Oh, um, well, you know, I don't ever actually watch the Oscars, so... Um, well, this is going to be a weird episode. Uh, Welcome, everyone. I'm your confused host, Chris Hudson. Um, and with me, as always, is Jason Holes. You know, Chris, I'm glad that Mike brought up the fact that uh, Paul and I actually met Charles Band. We did? Oh, that's right, we did. Paul, we have that photo, don't we? We can post that. Yeah, we should post that uh, on bmoviemania.com. Anyway, also with me is Mike Hayes. <laughs> Hold on, let me wash the mouth, the flavor of this fucking movie out of my mouth with some alert. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, that's better. Oh, oh, oh. And finally, I have to admit, I'm very surprised. He's back from jetpack land permanently, Paul Brooks. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. I was going to do the thing that Mike did. Now I don't know what to do. God damn sickies. Damn sickies. <laughs> so apparently this isn't the Oscar award winning movie. Which makes me wonder, don't movie producers have people who research titles? Like, wouldn't we all save ourselves a lot of trouble if someone in South Korea had known Charles Band and uh, already created a movie called Parasite? Do you think that like that the production team of the Academy Award winning uh, was like, No. Oh, dude, Charles <laughs> Band, he got this title. What do we do? Oh, should we do it? Should we not? Oh, let's just go for it. Chris, I'm really glad, actually, that you brought this up because this brings me to my bit for the night, a little something I'm calling Comparisites. <laughs> and then you play some music right there or whatever. Uh, Chris, it's funny that you just brought this up because the 2019 Parasite film was originally a remake of the 1982 Parasite. But after writing the first draft, uh, Bong Joon-ho thought it, quote, sucked royal ass. Wow, what do you know? And decided to scrap the project. And he moved on to another film called Striptease, but Ooh. decided to change the title to Parasite as an homage to oh, the original. Very nice. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, like we said, Parasite is an early movie directed by our old buddy, Charles Band. And it, uh, it was his second-ish directorial effort. And yeah. it mixes the body horror of Alien with a dystopia of Mad Max. Even for a shitty director like Charles Band, somehow you can still tell this is like his second movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mike, it's funny that you bring that up because that brings me to my second Comparisite. The 1982 Parasite was, of course, as we just mentioned, directed by Charles Band, who has directed 63 movies and various projects. The 2019 Parasite was directed by Bong Joon-ho, who has directed only 14 films, some of them short films. It's also worth noting that both men have the letter B in their names. Bong for Bong Joon-ho and Band for Charles Band. 
Paul, do you, I don't want to step on your bit here, but do you have one that says that Charles Band did a film called Evil Bong? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a oh wow, that's a good yeah. point. There's a lot of synchronicities here. I thought the original title for that was <laughs> Evil Bong Jun Ho. <laughs> they just wanted to shorten it because <laughs> shorten it, yes. they felt that it was too long. <laughs> Didn't you guys meet Charles Band once? We did. Yeah, we did. Thank you for bringing that up again. Uh, we'll actually post the photo twice in, yeah. in uh, <laughs> on our website. Yeah, bmoviemania.com. Go check it out. Yeah, it was great. We got to shake hands with him, you know, <laughs> for like five seconds. We were in Arkansas. Yeah, met him in Arkansas Ooh. at the Full Moon Horror Film Convention. I'm telling you, it's... Getting so a fella can't get away from the goddamn sickies no more. <laughs> so, Parasite, the 1982 version, stars Robert Glaudini and G.I. Jane herself, Demi Moore, in her first starring role. Lemon Farmer <laughs> Demi Moore. <laughs> Quick takes! All right, I'm pretty sure we all watched the correct movie at this point. I'm going to go in order from <laughs> Paul to Jay. Paul? <laughs> Chris, this movie had everything. Canned fruit, canned <laughs> beer, canned soup, and you're lucky because today it had lemonade. Nice. Thank you, Paul. Michael Hayes. Did you not do a quick take? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sounds like it. Oh, boy. Yeah. This movie, Parasite, was... Uh, mm, it won an award for little... Biggest miss of a movie at the Lemon Grove of 1992. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to write a quick take. All right, Jay, did you write anything? Uh, no, I didn't, but I'm going to try to speak from the heart. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm getting the impression here that I'm in the minority, but uh, I actually liked this movie. Fuck yourself, I, Jay. It was not what, what I expected at all. And I I rather enjoyed it, to be honest. What about you, Chris? Yeah, you know what? I just I'm just gonna say that I watched an interview from last fall uh, on the uh, James Corden show where Demi Moore uh, called Parasite the worst movie she's ever been in. I disagree. What? I I think she's been in way worse things. Chris, I'm really glad you brought this up because this brings me to my third from Parasite. <laughs> Nice. Actress Demi Moore, or Demi Moore, as James Corden was calling her. I don't know if you caught that or not. She made her film debut in the 1982 version of Parasite. In 2019, during an appearance on The Late Late Show with James Corden, Moore named Parasite as the worst movie she had ever been in. Ironically, she also had several scenes in the 2019 version of Parasite, but sadly, all of them were cut uh, because of pacing issues. <laughs> I only have one of these left. I have blown all of my Comparisites. Oh, God. <laughs> all right. So, well, let's just get into the movie discussion then. What the fuck is up with that opening? <laughs> <laughs> it was weird, man. It's a dream sequence of of our of our guy making a parasite, right? Making his yeah. making his little worm. Was it a dream? Well, I think it, he was dreaming of events that actually occurred. Is the way I took it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very trippy. You know what really sold it for me as he was really kind of dreaming the actual events. It kind of kept going back and forth between him and his lab creating the parasites and him strapped down to a gurney. But in the gurney scenes, uh, there's a lot of smoke being piped in. And any self-respecting lab. Well, why why would you just pipe in smoke? <laughs> why would you do that? Why would you pipe around smoke? It sold it for me. Yeah, it was a little bit uh, difficult to like figure out exactly what was going on with this opening sequence. It didn't help that the print of this movie looks like somebody took a shit on it and covered it in, in Vaseline. <laughs> well, I'm waiting for like Shout Factory to, to restore this thing. Jay, you would probably buy the Blu-ray if, if, if like uh, Scream Factory or somebody put out the Blu-ray. I'm like the only one who would buy it. <laughs> they obviously re-released it last year simply because the movie Parasite came out. Like, someone had the rights, and they're like, oh, fuck it, let's put it out. Probably banned. He's like, I'll make a few bucks. I could use a little something to eat. Well, all we got left these days, pal, is canned fruit, canned beer, and canned soup. 
at least the effects were pretty good. I mean, Stan Winston worked on them. Yeah, the effects were pretty good. You know, they're hand puppets. The parasites are hand puppets, but whatever. It's decent hand puppets. <laughs> yeah. So is Kermit. People love him. It's 1982. <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's that big billboard that says whatever what year it is. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah, I had no idea this movie was post-apocalyptic. Mm-hmm. Well, it was 1993. It's like the first <laughs> shot of the movie. It's it's just filmed in someone's fucking backyard of a small community up by Joshua Tree. That's all it was. Yeah. Which is post-apocalyptic. Yeah, that's what it looked like. I'm go- I was going to say maybe Palmdale, Mike. I, the only reason I say that is because Joshua, which Palmdale, I mean, you know, Palmdale's out there in the middle of fucking nowhere, right? Yeah, because they also shot some stuff at Vasquez Rocks, and that's up in that area. Is that the Gorn Rock, Paul? Because I don't have any idea of the the geography of California other than the Star Trek Gorn Rock. Yeah, that's where they uh, shot the famous Gorn fight scene for Star Trek. Uh, Star Trek Picard just shot there. I mean, virtually Ooh. every Star Trek has shot at Vasquez Rocks. And just so you know, Chris, it's about maybe an hour north of L.A. So so did anyone watch this in 3D? No. Don't think I had the option. <laughs> yeah, none of us did. Nope. We got This movie was filmed for 3D, though. Oh, yeah, that's true. And we didn't get to see it. And once I figured that out, because I got bored watching it, so I started doing my research while watching it, obviously. <laughs> and so, oh, shit, it's 3D. And then every time it was supposedly a 3D shot, you're like, ah, uh, that's why it looks like absolute horse shit right now. <laughs> Chris, did you notice that uh, when James Corden asked uh, Demi Moore about, you know, the worst movie she's ever been in, she <laughs> referred to it as Parasite 3D? Yeah, I did catch that. And I really <laughs> want to watch the 3D version because it, can't be any worse. Uh, I beg to differ <laughs> about that. If this movie gives you a headache, that makes it worse. Yeah, that would make it way worse. <laughs> Fuck me. Even Jay, the dissenter of the episode, wouldn't watch it in 3D. <laughs> I would not watch it in 3D. Uh, am I Am I just going to have to defend this movie the whole time? Tonight? I liked it too, Jay. I liked it too. All right. Fuck you too. Well, look. Okay. Can, should we talk about this? Like, look. It's got lasers that right up. Front, yeah. So did Night know? Beast, though. And you know what? Nice Beast had to, had at least oh two legs God. to stand on. This had zero legs because it was a slug oh, man. puppet. You know, I'd have to rewatch Night Beast to to compare the two here. Paul wakes up from his dream in his delivery van and explores the work camp. <laughs> yeah, man, he's I don't know where he's going, but he's in a, he's in a corporate van, right? From the people he's fleeing. Yeah. So Paul drives around and he finds this compound of people. Well, there's not that many people there, but he wanders around and hears this yeah. woman being uh, accosted by some some men. And I don't did you have a kink tank for that for what was going on there? King Chang. You're gonna like this one. Oh, Jesus. I thought this was gonna be a short episode. Well, I mean, how fast do you want to go through this? I'm just not feeling kinky tonight, that's all. All, all things is I have a kink tank for later, but... Uh... Oh, you do? <laughs> I was just trying to get a, get a kink tank going. Okay, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually terrible because it seems like they're assaulting this poor woman. Yeah, and also, yeah, that's why I don't have a kink tank for that. Yeah, and, and then they don't. Like, she's she's actually into it is yeah. pretty much the only Yeah, thing. current notes right here are all caps. What the fuck is happening here? What? Role, what? Role play? I don't... And then I just trail off on random letters. Well, so Paul saves her, right? Uh, from, from the sickies. Right. And uh, she attacks him. I think she was just really horny, and Paul fucking yeah. cock blocked her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he sure did. They were role playing, and that's a thing people do. I don't want. I don't want to say anything more because it was a rape scene and I didn't like it. I, I'm not sure why that that was even needed. There was there was no point. Well, no, it technically wasn't a rape scene. They were going to rape her in the role play that was going on, though. He literally said, "Quit wiggling around," and she's like, "No, no." And then he says, uh, "You're gonna like it and shut up." And so, yeah, it was a role play of rape. I mean, look, all, all it was. Everybody knows that like early '80s movies, this sort of time frame. There was just a lot of unfortunate stuff happening to women where they were topless and bad things were happening to them. And this is just another example. No, she was complicit, though. She was consenting to the situation. She was part yeah, of their gang. Yeah, I guess so. It was weird. This is the worst kink tank ever. <laughs> this is not a kink tank. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's terrible. It was it was pretty funny. I mean, every, the audience should have known when the kink tank, like the stinger on the kink tank was kind of a... You ain't gonna like this one. (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, one thing I did like about this scene, though, is all the stock footage of the snakes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, love snakes. Well, hey, show the stock footage of the snake <laughs> <laughs> in the first part of the scene. Use the stock footage of the snake by the last check, part of the scene. Check off stock footage of a snake is pretty uh, <laughs> pretty solid. Yes. Don't quite think that's how it works, but sure. Yes, because Paul wrestles with one of the men after cock blocking <laughs> and then uh, gets him bitten by a snake. One thing I love, though, between the the fights here with Paul and the sickies and the women, and the girl is that we meet Buddy. He's and he's just a character that sounds completely racist against sickies and really loves his coffee. Come on over to my room and I'll uh, give you a cup of coffee. Coffee. That's right. Real coffee. But also totally seems to mm. come on to Paul. Like he's really into Paul. Like he says, you know, give you a cup of coffee. And he sounds like he's got like a wink and a smile. Like there's something more than coffee that he wants. <laughs> I've come on Paul before. Huh. Um, <laughs> uh, we were roommates for a lot of years. King Tang. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't get the impression that the old guy was hitting on him at all. Yeah, and also Paul Dean is, spends the entire film trying to save his own life because there's a parasite about to burst out of him. I don't think he's thinking about that. Oh, thanks for bringing that up, Jay. Because this movie could have saved me a whole lot of fucking pain if he just throwed his goddamn body in a fucking volcano and been done with it. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> because we learn at some point, sorry to jump the fuck ahead, but we find out that he was working in a lab, there was a bunch of parasites, this company was paying for it, he found out they were bad, so he killed all the bad parasites, one of them spilled on him, and one got away. The one that spilled on him is in his body, the other one that got away is out there. It's in a tank, it's in a canister that he has. Pink tank. But we find out that the what's going to happen is the the... the, the Parasite is gonna, this big slug inside of his body is going to like explode effectively and send a million spores into the air and if a spore lands on you, you get a parasite. Fucking bury your body and die, you piece of shit! Don't make me watch an hour and a half of fucking horse shit! All right, I guess it's rating time. <laughs> <laughs> you just want to give the rating and... No, I have a off. kink tank eventually to give, and it's important, so I have to hang around for that. Look, Chris, all I'm saying okay. is that if you've ever had, like, a tapeworm or something like that, your top priority is not, like, to get your fuck on. You want to, like, get... You deal with your, you know, problems. Yeah, and he has to shoot his parasite with a syringe in his gun. <laughs> All right, okay. All right, I get that that may not be the most <laughs> sexy thing you can do in a movie, so... Sorry to disappoint. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Paul, our afflicted hero, drives to the resort town of Joshua. This is where I like to hang out. This It's great. There's like five people living there. <laughs> I think there's eight. Hey, well, you know, we are we just going to blow past the entire gas station scene? <laughs> well, no, well, okay, well, okay. He, no, I'm kidding, the, I'm kidding, I'm yeah, kidding. Totally there's a whole gas station scene. <laughs> it's okay. Where he wants to pay with some money, and your money's still good here, silver only. Yeah, and, no, they barter, it's all fine, whatever. Doesn't matter. He eventually finds a hotel in Joshua. Um, yeah, does anybody want to talk about the the hotel owner? What was her name? She Well, she was billed as Elizabeth, hmm. but she says her name is Maggie. Yeah, Maggie, Maggie, that's right. Um, she just sort of gives him a room and says that they have electricity from 7 to 9 and water's free. And he gives her a gold ring in exchange for the room. And she would do anything for a fresh tube of lipstick. It is important to know she says she's not wearing much makeup and she wishes she had some because it's expensive. But she's wearing a fuck ton of makeup. I think that's the <laughs> joke. <laughs> yeah, she's the old yeah. starlet with too much makeup kind of. Well, like. I think it's important. I yeah. think this was retconned into the film. I'm almost positive this was retconned <laughs> into the film to make things work later. So, what, dear listener, what element was retconned? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spoil it for the listener. <laughs> I'm gonna let everyone unsolve this puzzle and unwrap this package as it goes along. But listen, remember, this woman claims she's not wearing much makeup. But she's wearing a lot of makeup, and that's going to be very important later in the film. <laughs> well, this brings me to something I think was really interesting about the movie. No, I mean, like, genuinely interesting is that she was played by actress Vivian Blaine, who I'm not super familiar with, but I did a little research. And she was a big star on Broadway in, like, kind of during the golden age of Hollywood, the 1940s, 1950s. And she was a really big actress. 
and this is the twilight of her career. Mm. And we've got Demi Moore in like the very beginnings of her career. And it's interesting how low budget movies like this kind of like actors yeah. and actresses kind of like pass through different phases yeah. of their career. Yeah, this is one of her last movies. All thanks to Charles Band. All thanks to Charles this Band. This is so meta. I'm looking at her on IMDb right now. <laughs> I like stuff like that, Chris, in all seriousness. I like it when like there's somebody really young and up and coming mixed with somebody who's like in the twilight of their career. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, you can't really tell yeah. until, yeah. you know, it's all said and done who sh- Demi Moore right. was going to turn into, you know, but it's, mm-hmm. it's neat to see. Right. It's a great question. What has she turned into? Anti-vaxxer? What's up? <laughs> 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 Sorry, continue. Yeah, she's probably fine, right? I think yeah. she's fine. <laughs> Well, hey, Pat is here. Pat is in Little Miss Lemon Grove of 1992, huh? So I, I, I just really like how the plot hasn't even kicked in at this point. You've got some it's a slow burn, little parasite teases at the beginning, and we're almost half an hour into this movie. Yeah, and fuck all yeah. has happened. It's a very slow burn. I found that there was enough though to keep me interested. <laughs> can I, Chris? Can I take the part? Can I discuss the part of the film where the black Lamborghini pulls up to the gas station? Yes, please. Because this okay. is about the time we meet our villain that we talked about. Yeah, before. I'm going to go into this in great detail. So here fantastic. We go. <laughs> just stretch it out as long and pad this bitch just like the movie. Yes. No. The 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 black Lamborghini pulls up. And the guy at the gas station off. They said he he has some canned water, um, and we meet Wolf the Merchant here, who is I believe also was had been in some things. You know he he was not. This is not his first rodeo. Yeah, I think he'd been in a lot of stuff. I know he cut his hair for this role. Guys, I have an announcement to make. I am bringing back an old segment called Carfax. <laughs> Carfax. Great. <laughs> it's really terrific. In this film, the merchant who pulls up in the black Lamborghini does ask Wolf the trader to fill up his car with methane, which might sound like an interesting and quirky futuristic fuel for a car, but actually it's not. In the past, NGVs, or natural gas vehicles, have existed. Uh, in a natural gas-powered vehicle, energy is released by combustion of essentially methane gas fuel with oxygen from the air to carbon dioxide and water vapor to an internal combustion engine. <laughs> methane is the cleanest burning hydrocarbon and many contaminants presented in natural gas are removed at source. <laughs> uh, that was Carfax re- revisited. I thought this was going to be a Lamborghini fact. <sighs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I love Jay's tenacity to get through this at least. Thank you, Mike, for that interesting and fascinating discussion. <laughs> we're, at, uh, we're, at, we're at Collins now. Collins is a cool character. Hey, Collins! Collins! Collins, we're here. Collins! Collins! Collins. Yeah, I really need you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> Collins owns the bar. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, Jay, sorry. I need to quickly interject, because this is where we kind of get a glimpse of what happened to make it a post-apocalyptic situation. (laughs) Um, And we don't hear much, but Colin has this scar on his face. And he does say at some point, atomic shit was falling from the skies. People started dropping like flies, which also sounds like a dope-ass fucking mixtape. Also, we kind of get the idea that something atomic happens. It wasn't just this parasite that was the thing. Like, I think the parasite was something that happened after the apocalypse happened. So, like, so we kind of learned that something atomic, probably a nuclear bomb or whatever happened, right? So just setting the environment of stuff. I thought that was a very important line that they don't talk about at any other point in this movie. I just lost my appetite. And then the gang comes in. Yeah. Which, okay. Perfect. God damn it. What? You know, the other thing that's weird about this movie, uh, almost kind of similar to FP in a way, is that it's post-apocalyptic, but also kind of not in a way. Like, you can still buy gas if you want to. You can still buy a fucking Lamborghini, Paul. (laughs) So do you think that that's what the apocalypse is? Because we're not far off. Do you think that that's what it's really going to be like, where there's still some sort of system in place to, like, kind of get what you need? I think you're right. (laughs) Yeah, sounds right. It's just part of the backdrop. I think actually contextually through this, uh, our hero, Paul Dean, does try to pay with paper money throughout right. the film. And they everyone he's out in he's out in the boonies, right? So he's from a big city. So I, I imagine 
in the big cities, there is still economy as we know it right now, right? <laughs> things are probably really expensive. Things are probably fucking fucked up there, but they still have like a governmental like situation where they can spend <laughs> money that has been, you know, approved by a government. <laughs> you have to barter. It's just a different economic system in the in the apocalypse. That's a lot of fucking coffee packets you have to trade yeah. for that Lambo. Yeah, and I think I think since we're out in the boonies, these are the people who don't trust that shit. So it'll be the entire Midwest come five years from now. Uh, it'll just be no one trusts any sort of fucking government or money. And it'll be just, you know, uh, silver only. In this movie, it was always silver. He paid with silver coin. He had a silver shard, whatever. And I'm willing to bet that that's part of why Jay liked this movie. Yeah, I think it'll just be a slow stranglehold, Paul. We'll all slowly choke to death as the resources keep going oh, up and up and up. Just a sort of like vaguely cyberpunk aspect to it. I like I like films that are, are warning signs of things to come that people can use as a roadmap for survival. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Indeed, indeed. Speaking okay. of warning signs, the shitty kid gang t- comes in. <laughs> yes. I was surprised that they had so much to do in the movie. Yeah, they were like like central to the plot, like pretty big characters. Yeah. This is the be- they are the best part of the movie. Think so? The most interesting yeah, part. Yeah, I would agree. But there were three of the gang members that are notable, kind of as an aside, outside of this movie. The first mm-hmm. one, so the first one is the leader, Rickus, right? <laughs> Great name. Play, played by Luca Bercovici. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Which we know him as Rickus, the gang leader in this movie. But you may also know him as the co-creator of the Ghoulies franchise. Yes, uh, that is how I knew him. <laughs> yeah. What? The punk band, the Groovy Ghoulies? No, the little monsters that come out of the toilet. <laughs> oh. Those ghoulies. Oh, well, good for him. Yeah. Those ghoulies. I love when they go to college. <laughs> I've never actually seen a ghoulies movie, so uh, I just remember seeing it in my VHS like video store when I was a kid, but mm-hmm. always fascinated by that fucking puppet coming out of the toilet, but never never saw it. Well, Chris, I have... Uh... I have Ghoulies 4 over here if you ever want to borrow it on DVD. Nice. I'm going to skip right ahead to the best one. Hey, Chris, don't <laughs> yeah. skip that because in part three, they do go to college. God so you damn might it. Wanna, I got to watch that one now. Son check of a that bitch. Out. But the second of the kid gang to walk in is, uh, I think her name is Dana, but she's named by, I hope I'm pronouncing this right also, Cherry Curry, the former lead singer of the fucking Runaways. Wait, what? Yeah. Huh. The song Cherry Bomb, Cherry Bomb, was written about her. <laughs> what? I'm surprised they didn't use that as the fucking theme song. They, like, really underutilized her. They totally underutilized her. Talk about Zeke. <laughs> well, Zeke, I was not going to talk about him, but he um, he actually was an early AIDS activist in Hollywood back in the, uh, I believe, the mid to late 80s. Who the fuck are you? What is all this research? I love it. Yeah, I, know, I just like to think that you knew all this. You, well, you're you like, oh, clearly it's it's Cherry. I didn't do like, much research here. Like, oh, of course it's Cherry. <laughs> I know all about but her. But he formed one of the main AIDS foundations, a big AIDS charity back in the, back when it was still... Not an accepted disease, I guess. Well, we uh, lose one playmate, we find another. Huh? Anyway, finally, the third person, well, fourth now, the fourth notable character is Arn, a character whose name I only know because I read IMDb. Arn? Why is he notable? Because he is played by Freddie Moore, who you might know as the husband <laughs> of Demi Moore at this time period. <laughs> oh, really? What? Yeah, she did meet him on this film. No, well, no. They've been married for a while by the time they made this film. Really? Yeah. Like, they met when she was... This guy? Yes, that guy. <laughs> for the listener, Paul is holding up his phone to be like, this guy's who to de- be married. <laughs> My gods. What the hell was she thinking? They met when he was in his late 20s. She was, I believe, 16 or 17. Oh, fuck off. It's a very wholesome story. He divorced his wife. <laughs> To marry Demi Moore. And that's where she got her stage name. Is this what the episode is going to be from here on out? Just factoids? Just factoids and trivia, Paul. That's all we're doing. Hey, we're now uh, People's <laughs> B-Movie Mania podcast. We work for People Magazine now. Let's talk about all the stuff. <laughs> to move this fucking paparazzi ahead, we get some fights. <laughs> we get some guns. Collins has a shotgun. Demi Moore has a gun. They fight off some kids. 
<laughs> the kids move from person to person to like beat people up. Uh, they eventually kidnap Paul and ransack his room and steal the kink tank. I'm sorry, they steal the parasite canister. And Zeke, the the AIDS activist I mentioned earlier, he really, really wants to open that canister. I mean, does this seem like a good idea? No! They, I mean, what did they think was going to happen? There's nothing good that could be in that canister. Well, hold on. No, that because... The, uh, Paul says that it's medical supplies, mm. and so they think that it's some sort of drugs that they can get uh, into. Okay. I guess, but any sort of biological-looking canister, yeah, you 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 get what you deserve. The the other thing is that Paul could have easily just said, "Look, it's a deadly parasite. Don't open it." <laughs> he doesn't ever say that. <laughs> he did say, "If you if you open it, you die." He well, said that to but them. That, there are so many ways this movie could have not happened. <laughs> <laughs> but it does, and he opens it, and he s- sticks his hand in there. Oh, and a really sweet 3D shot that was made. Yeah, it's like yeah. You get the hand coming right for the camera. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> I think the fucking parasite jumps out and latches on his shoulder. There's something wet in here. Yeah, and they, it jumps out and, and attaches itself to Zeke, right? And then they kick the crap out of Paul for, <laughs> just because of this. And the movie fades to black as they're pounding the crap out of Paul. It's a weird edit here, because then when he comes comes to, he's with Demi Moore. Back at her place. And she gives him tea, rattlesnake, hot. Well, hey, this was Charles Mann's second movie. He forgot to film a scene, I guess. So He didn't know how to get from Paul getting... It, a mud hole stomped in him to <laughs> Paul laying with Demi Moore. He did not know how to do that, so he faded to black. I mean, the whole thing felt weird because it kept fading to black like it was a TV movie yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah. It just, yeah. Yeah. like, eh, stuff happens, and then he's here. I really kept expecting commercials for Night Beast Industries to pop up here and there. Also, thank you, Night Beast Industries. <laughs> <laughs> so here's where Wolf shows up to... Tell us how much he hates liars and loves lemonade. <laughs> oh, yeah, the guy, the nice man from the beginning. Buddy. Tries to cover for Paul for some reason, and what's he get for it? Gets his hand sliced off by a laser. <laughs> by by a fucking Travis Bickle fucking laser. Yeah, and then, and then it fades to black. Like, what happened to him? I mean, he probably bled out, I guess, Paul. Do we need to get into that? No, it's fine. Anyone got a medical corner uh, segment? No, no keep God, going. No. <laughs> Who is it now? Open the door. What do you want? Open the door, lady. Out of the way. Wolf, like, asks around town. He goes to the gas station. He talks to Collins, gets some fresh lemonade, and eventually he finds out where Paul is staying. He kind of ransacks the room that's already been ransacked by the kid gang. Twice. Yeah, it's been ransacked twice now. Well, Maggie goes through his room. The punks go through. Everybody goes through Paul's room. So uh, it doesn't find shit because the kids took everything. But I think at this point, Paul uh, convinces Demi Moore to go with him to get his equipment so he can find a cure for the parasite. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because Paul's real sad and sorry for himself. (laughs) Well, he's also dying. Instead of just fucking burying himself into the ground so when the parasite explodes, it can't do anything. (laughs) Fucking just do that. Save the world. Fuck yourself. You're a dumbass anyway. (laughs) Fuck off. I hate you. Along those lines, he should have just hugged Zeke, and they should have set them all on fire. <laughs> Movie's done. Surely you can't kill the parasite by setting the host and the parasite on fire. What kind of ending will that be? Well, I'm sure we'll get to the discussion of how this thing <laughs> oh, dies God. later in a couple hours. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's cut back to the kids. Zeke is about to die. Sunrise, he dies. And great beginning of a day right there. <laughs> great. Great beginning of a day. (laughs) Okay, there's a tense scene because, yes, uh, Zeke is dead, and then Rickus is like, where's the thing? And he goes over to Dana, and they pull over the blanket, and and the parasite's just cuddling right there next to her. (laughs) It's very cute. Favorite shot of the movie. (laughs) (laughs) And she has to just roll over and leave, but she doesn't, and the thing, bah, sticks to her leg. (laughs) It was just, just sitting there next to her for the longest time. Yeah, like... If you're a parasite, what is, what's the delay? Like, get on her leg. 
<laughs> okay, guys, we're being really hard on this parasite. This parasite has been parasiting for so fucking long. It has been constantly parasiting. When does it get a break? When does it get a nap? Let it snuggle up, be the little spoon for a minute before it goes back into the world and parasites some more. Let it fucking rest. Parasite's gonna parasite. That's what I'm saying. Leave the parasite alone. All right, I'm gonna rush through the rest of this bullshit. We gotta get to that king tank at some point. <laughs> yeah, well, we gotta get to the whole like comedy bit where everyone's looking for everyone else and just barely misses each other. Rebecca gets his girlfriend into town and you know, puts her up in the boarding room in the room next to where Paul was staying. And they find out, oh, Paul's a doctor, we gotta figure out what's going on. So Rick goes to find Paul. But this is after Jimmy Moore goes to find Collins, the, the diner owner guy. She can't find him. Rick is fucking misses Paul and Denny Moore, and the wolf goes after everyone, and uh, it's just a fucking mess right now. I don't even know what I'm saying. <sighs> <laughs> Everyone's looking for everyone. There's not that many people around, so it's easy to sure. miss everybody. Yes, it is. Did you guys know that uh, Robert Glaudini, is that how you say his name? Sure. He has uh, written lots <laughs> of plays, and he uh, he was in a sleazy wrestling... He played a sleazy wrestling pr promoter called uh, Dr. Tweed, in Grunt, the wrestling movie. Yeah, I wish we watched that one. I'm just trying to pad the episode. I'm just trying to pad the episode. <laughs> I'm just trying to help Chris pad this episode. A <laughs> Thanks little bit. for bringing this to a halt. Thank you, Paul, for doing your research in the middle of our goddamn episode. Sure. Really, really means a lot to me. <laughs> no problem. In the meantime, Wolf is there to find Paul too. Paul just wanders off in the in the fucking desert leaving Demi Moore to herself, because he can't figure yeah, it out. He thinks he's dead. He does. He, he keeps saying he needs that other parasite. Only way he can find a cure is to find that other parasite. Mm-hmm. But Wolf gets to Demi Moore's place first, and, you know, at this point, like, <sighs> Wolf yeah. really likes to beat the shit out of her. Yeah, that was rough. Well, that happens a lot. Yeah, he yeah. slaps her around. I feel pretty bad, but then Rickus comes to save the day. Well, Rickus had some conflict, you know. He uh, yeah. See, I that I I kind of dug that. He wasn't you know? all bad. Let's put it that way. He had some sort of no, and that's what I found was interesting. E except, you know, Rickus really didn't save the day so much as drive his really loud car to alert Wolf that someone was there. So Wolf stopped beating up Demi Moore in her vegetable garden to go fight Rickus instead. Well, that's all it took. She's lived. She did, and she, she kind of took live. it like a champ. Yeah, like. Paul shows up eventually, and he's like, you okay? Yeah. And she's like, yeah, I'm fine. No big deal. But that's also where Paul figures out how to f figure out the cure. What, he Jesus that shit? Yes. I was tempted by the <laughs> devil three times, and he told me each time, use a fucking high-pitched frequency, you dumbass. It turns yes. out it was right. He just drops it. He just wandered the desert, and then he came back, and he had it figured out. <laughs> uh, but, Mike, I got to say, though, yeah, you can kill it with high-frequency sound. What? But yeah. how are you going to know... Which frequency to use without a little bit of the parasite's fluid? Wait, wait, Chris, the fluid, are you talking about how it's like really slimy and like gooey? Mm. Oh, come on. I thought that would be the kink tank. <laughs> okay, but what about on the outside of its body? No, like the fluid that's inside its parasitic sac body. Does anyone want to say that the parasite was slimy, please? No, I don't think that's good enough. No. Oh, that brings me to my uh, first installment <laughs> of kink tank. <laughs> Oh, what do we have? Some sort of kink tank. At last. First event intended one. <laughs> For Micophilia, <laughs> Damn it. is the sexual interest in being crawled upon or nibbled on by insects such as ants and other small creatures. This paraphilia often involves the application of insects on the genitals, but other areas of the body may also be on the focus. The desired effect may be a s tickling or stinging, or in the case of slugs, like our parasite, slimy sensation. Oh, what do we have? Some sort of kink tank. Uh, uh, sorry, what's next? <laughs> well, unfortunately for the parasite, none of the people in the movie were into that. Ah, oh, that's a bummer. Parasite drops off Cherry Bomb, kills Maggie, and I mean, this is where we get some really great, where the effects really play out, because Cherry Bomb yeah. looks pretty fucking dead. We go into uh, to Maggie's room where she's playing with some makeup. We get some great 3D stuff going on if you ha are watching the 3D version. Well, well, the slug is, like, climbing on the ceiling at some point, yeah. right? 
Mm-hmm. And like, what's it doing? Yeah, it's a big parasite now. It is, but it's also <laughs> drooling, on, like <laughs> dropping onto her hands and all this kind of stuff. Oh, that brings me to my segment, second uh, intended king tank. King tank. Oh my god. God damn it. No, this yeah. is still about form of. Formicophilia, <laughs> but in the first reported case of formicophilia, Chris, please cut that out. Oh my God, I um, yeah, okay, I'll cut that out. But Mike, I'm really glad you brought this up because this brings me to my last comparison. Robert Glaudini, who we have been talking about all episode as Dr. Paul. Yeah, he directed a lot of plays, including. Well, he wrote, he wrote actually, uh, a hit off-Broadway play called Jack Goes Boating, which was directed by Peter Dubois and starred Philip Seymour Hoffman. Parasite 2019, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman didn't see it. Wow. No, I can't imagine he did. Hey, Paul, I'm really glad you brought up Parasite 2019, because that brings me to my final kink tank of the episode. Kink <laughs> tank. No. You're just looking stuff up now. Seven years before Parasite 2019 came out, another case was described. At the age of 14, the patient saw an ice cream stick covered with ants and wondered how it would feel if his penis was in place of the stick. He began letting ants crawl on his genitals, especially fire ants, a practice he found sexually exciting and that continued into adulthood. No. Cut it out. No. Hey. No. Hey, don't yuck this yum, man. Formicophilia is a thing, man. No. Oh, my God. I don't even know what. You know what? I I think this is going to be the only (laughs) unreleased episode of (laughs) B-Movie Media. Mike, you don't have any more Carfax? <laughs> oh. After the fucking parasite springs of, uh, surprises Demi Moore by hiding behind a uh, a picture frame, Paul and Demi Moore Whoa. catch the thing, get some fluid. Whoa! <laughs> Are we blowing past Maggie? No, we talked about Maggie. We talked about Maggie. She fucking died. This is very important. Yeah, we blew past Maggie. It it lands on her. It drains her yeah. face and of fluid, and you see her kind of go large march, <laughs> and then her head blows up. And, well, this is what's really important, because yes. she's obviously, her head blows up like Jay says, and it's a pretty good practical effect, but she is uh, obviously some sort of a puppet or a stand-in uh, uh, thing here, and uh, is super fucking pale. And so I'm pretty sure that the only reason she was saying she puts on a lot of makeup, because we see her in this scene putting on way even more makeup, is because Mm -hmm. they needed to make her face look like it could plausibly be that puppet. You think so? I think that's why they retconned it at the beginning. Uh, That's an interesting theory. Tell you what, Mike. Tell you what. Next time Paul and I hang out with Charles Band, we'll ask him. (laughs) Okay, sounds good. I hope to see a picture of that someday. So fucking Maggie gets her head exploded by the parasite while Paul and Demi Moore, I don't even know what Demi Moore's character is. She's just Demi Moore. Pat. She's a lemon fun. She's, she's, she's a lemon. Pat. 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 Her name is Pat. That's right, Pat. Pat. <laughs> so Paul and Pat, like that sounds better than Paul and Demi. Um, Paul and Pat go looking for the parasite in the boarding house. And the parasite is smart enough to hide behind a picture frame. <laughs> to, ha-ha, surprise Demi Moore. <laughs> but it misses. They catch it in a blanket. They stab it with a syringe to get its vital fluids. And now, finally, Paul can figure out a cure. We've got to get to that other parasite and extract a sample of its fluid. And then what? I can determine its frequency and use it to kill the one inside me. Let's talk about the parasite cure. Okay, but here's the thing. Here, here's uh, something where I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Like, it works. You know, they turn this sound thing up, whatever it is, some sort of sound device that causes high frequencies. <laughs> and it works in the sense that the parasite can't handle it and, like, launches itself out of Paul's stomach. <laughs> but Yeah, it's gross. It does not look good for Paul. Like, I mean, like, nice it was fucks. in his stomach and, and like... It, it bursts out. It bursts out of him like like alien style. What I like about this scene is that the fluid was so vital <laughs> to figuring out the correct frequency. They couldn't have just hooked up that machine back at Demi Moore's place and like, all right, fuck off out of my gut here. <laughs> Let's try it. Turn the knob. Woo! 
that's it. This machine they use didn't seem capable of too many different frequencies. And how many different frequencies are there? Come on. There's like seven at least. You know. Paul could have figured it out. Maybe. Maybe. Could have brute forced that son of a bitch and that fucking parasite is out in their fucking vegetable garden. But no. <laughs> but no. I love how it implies though they're going to use sound against the big parasites. But that's not entirely what happens. Let's talk about the end. Eventually, Collins and Rickus try to sort of all work together here, and Wolf is really the main bad guy, and Rickus tries to save Collins, right? Yeah, he does. And, uh, yeah, he does. He does. And then Wolf gets a shot off with his laser and kills Rickus. The guy, you kind of, you, you didn't like him in the beginning, then he was, like, kind of okay, and then he tries to do a good thing in the end, and he gets killed. Well, so, what? So I mean, he redeems himself, but he has to, you know, sort of, like, pay pay for some of the stuff that he's he's done previously. Right. Well, he's right. also like, it's not just right then that he suddenly turns out to be someone who's being useful. He's doing it for the last too long of a movie. Most of the movie. Like, Most yeah, of the like movie, we, yeah. He's, he's, him and his gang are introduced as assholes. At some point, they understand that they need to fucking do something. And so they are... It, 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 I thought this was interesting that they actually used the the bad gang, which usually in most movies become like the pawn of the merchants or something, right? Like that's what he would have been for this, because mm-hmm. they would have like been like, oh, we'll pay you money, go fuck up the the doctor or whatever. But that's not what happened. He ends up being like, fuck this, I need to save my friend, figure out what's going on. This Paul Dean guy actually is gonna be useful and good and whatever, so I'm gonna help with this. And so he does shit. Well, they kind of they kind of explained that because yep. uh, Rickus used to belong to the corporation. He lived in a work camp or the suburbs, as yeah. he said, and he's got yeah. the tattoo and everything. So he is totally once he finds out that Wolf is this merchant, he's like, "Fuck this guy! I'm not having anything to do with him," and he yeah. hates that guy. So yeah, he kind of become aligns himself yeah, with the yeah. good guys. Well, it was an interesting choice. Yeah. So Paul is saved. But not from Wolf. And there's still the big old parasite to deal with. It attaches itself to Wolf. It finds Wolf and, like, attaches itself to him. And he goes, like, stumbling out of a window or something with Paul. And, like, falls onto the ground. Pretty good shot. That's all right. It's pretty grainy. <laughs> Again, the, this thing needs a new transfer. And so they land next to, like, a... Uh, what, would you, what would you call it? Like a, a kink tank. <laughs> no, not next to... That's more, that probably more falls into the Carfax zone, because they land on top of a methane tank, like on top of the methane tank. Hey, Mike, if that's your kink, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm not going to yuck that yum. I don't know what that means. Then Paul Dean shouts, shoot the tank. So Demi shoots the tank. A bullet goes into the tank. Fire comes out. Then he, then Paul yells, no, the tank. (laughs) And then so she shoots it again. (laughs) And this is where I understood why I hate Paul. (laughs) Yeah, but it gets the job done. The tank blows up and the uh, parasite blows up and Wolf blows up and credits. Turns out they didn't really need those uh, high frequency sound waves after all. No. Shocking. Yeah. Explosion did the trick. But you know there is at the at the very end Patty says you're finally free it's over right and then they show this ambiguous shot it's just this dark something and there's sort of a wind sound it's this weird abstract shot at the very end and so it's you, the burned corpse of the guy of wolf yeah was it See, was I it? thought it was another parasite okay. which goes into like I read Charles Band wanted to make a sequel to this at some point, but got distracted by Puppet Master and all those other things. His 50 uh, other films. You guys you guys are confused. Okay, it's very obviously understandable. It's Charles Van's second movie. This is... Uh, he, he wasn't good at, like, pulling apart the pieces. So, it zooms in slowly on the burned-up corpse, you know, of Wolf and the parasite there. And then Demi is actually speaking not to them, but to us, the audience member. And she says, you're finally <laughs> free. It's over. <laughs> And then it cuts the credits, which gives us permission to turn it off. You know, you know, Mike, what one thing that I find interesting about that that interpretation is because that leads me into rating time. Rating time. I'm like, please tell oh, me. Oh, thank God. That's a yeah, I'm like, don't tell know. me you have a bit planned somehow. 
So Demi Moore was in Parasite, but she was also in the movie Ghost, co-starring Patrick Swayze. Oh, so we're going to rate this oh. 1 to 100, Peace Ways. Very nice. Very nice. Going with the classic. Nice. Peace Ways. We're going to go with this one. We're going we're gonna to rate this from Mike to Jay. Oh boy, I have to go first. <laughs> Yeah, I, wait. I I say that Mike goes last because I I want him to like bring the fire. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna rate this from Jay to Mike. All right, fine. Yeah. Uh, look, okay, we have beat the tar out of this movie, <laughs> and I'm gonna tell you, and it is not that bad. It really isn't. No, you stop. You stop. You'll get your chance. It's not that bad. It it gives you just enough to kind of know that it's post-apocalyptic. There's a lot of gaps. They don't do a lot of world building. But I felt like there was enough to get it and to see what was going on. I liked the fact that there weren't a ton of characters, and so you spent quite a bit of time with each character and you see these shifting alignments like we were talking about. Like, you think Rickus is bad, he turns good, and then Wolf is the obvious bad guy through the whole thing. He's driving a Lamborghini and he has a laser. I mean, come on, he's not that bad. You know, the, the lemons, it would have been cool had the lemons had something to do with the, ki- the, the parasite killing it. Like, that would have been a nice connection since Demi was a lemon farmer. Uh, but I thought it was fine. The characters are quirky. You know, Paul's a little flat, but he's sick. Give him a break. You know, you know, I, I'm I'm not gonna rate this poorly. I, I'm gonna I would buy the Blu-ray with all of the uh, Demi Moore interviews <laughs> and Charles Pan featurettes. That's not uh, gonna you know, happen. Well, we can hope. Uh, you know, I'd watch part two <laughs> if there was a part two. Uh, I'm gonna go uh, seventy-six pieceways. Wow! Uh, all right. I I didn't have a problem at all watching this movie. <laughs> Well, Paul, do you disagree? I don't necessarily disagree, but you know how uh, sometimes on this podcast we'll watch a movie and then we start talking about it and we like are having like fun talking about it, so we rate it higher. I feel like the opposite happened with this movie, <laughs> where like the more we talked about it, we're just like, oh god. No, I'm a- I'm with Jay on this one. <sighs> I mean, I definitely didn't like it as much. I thought the pacing was slow, which is to be expe- expected for, like, an early 80s movie. And, you know, I have a 4K TV, so it's really tough to watch something that looks this crappy. Um, I mean, the aspect ratio, like, we didn't touch on it, but <laughs> it was the, the aspect ratio was, like, stretched, you know? Like, clear, clearly it was, like, 4 by 3 stretched to widescreen and, like, mm-hmm. it, it looked like half of the picture was missing sometimes. So it's not a pleasant... Yeah. In terms of, you know, the quality, it wasn't pleasant. But yeah, I mean, all the stuff that Jay said, I pretty much agree with, and I kind of like the tone of it and everything. So, I don't know. Um, what'd you say, Jay? 76? Yeah. I'll go 52, peaceways. Okay. Mike, you gonna bring us down a little more? Anyone who owns a fucking Lamborghini is a piece of shit, Jay. I disagree with you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway... There's no good person with a Lamborghini. It's fine for the film. I think he owned it. No, that guy's a piece of shit. People drive crazy (laughs) stuff in films. He has a laser gun. Fuck him. Let me finish this more. Okay. Oh, okay. The Malort's gone now. He's the bad guy of the movie. I'm not sure what you expect. And I'm pretty sure the company he worked for owned the Lamborghini. You want him to drive a sensible Honda Fit? (laughs) A black one. (laughs) All I want was... For this movie to have been over, all he had to do was catch Paul Dean. All that guy had to do, he had one job catch him, the movie ends. That's all I need. And he didn't give that to me. All he did was fucking jerk off into the fucking desert. Nothing happened. His Lambo fucked him up the ass a couple times, which is fine if that's your thing. But I wanted him not to be distracted, and I wanted him to catch Paul Dean and kill him. Maniacs. Very sorry. Because Paul Dean sucked. That fucking character was a fucking garbage, boring person, and it was uninteresting, and I fucking wished he died when the slug burst out of his body like any other person would have, but didn't. We got to have our hero live on, that fucking slimy (sighs) cocksucker. Wow. Okay. So we're... I didn't rate it yet, Hudson. Let me finish. This movie should have been over... 
so much faster, but it was slow. It was tedious. It was laborious. <laughs> that might sound redundant, but it's important to emphasize what this movie felt like. <sighs> somehow, Charles Van got better. <laughs> Not somehow. Good job on him. <laughs> figured that. Figured out movies better. Man, I don't know. Fuck, man. I. You can do it. I almost called my mom to ask if I could just not watch this. Like, I almost called her and said, do I have to? Please, could you call in sick for me? Please. I didn't want to finish it. And I look, and I'm 10 minutes left, and I'm like, fuck, I still don't want to do it. I might call her. But it didn't. I powered through it. And so, I don't know, for Peaceway-wise, I don't know, I've been on this earth 37 <laughs> years, so I don't know, give it half of that Peaceways. Oh, Wait, what is that? Math is hard, Mike. It's 39.5. No, it's not 39.5! Yeah, fine, 39.5. 39.5. You're giving it 39.5? Because I fucked up on my thoughts, yeah. All right, Chris. Um, You know what? 62 piece ways. Wow. Not even going to justify it. I agree with everyone. <laughs> All right. Okay. Chris, I feel bad for you. I, I feel bad because, like, I th I this was a great pick for the podcast, like, in terms of the bit, you know, with Parasite having just one best picture. Yeah. And I and like half of us didn't mind the movie, but for some reason, maybe just because it's kind of like, you know, with with the slow pace, it just makes it a little difficult sometimes to like get through it. It is somehow terrible and not that bad at the same time. On the next episode of B-Movie Mania. Well, guys, I know that last movie took place in 1993, uh, which obviously becomes a shitstorm. But let's rewind seven years to 1986, when a top secret agent is murdered. His estranged gymnast son, Lance Stargrove, played by John <laughs> Stamos, yes. teams up with yes. his dad's seductive and deadly associate to face his father's killer, the fiendish mastermind, Velvet Von Ragnar, played by Gene Simmons. <laughs> We're watching 1986's Never Too Young to Die, the fucking movie that will Murder us by how good Oh my it is. god, I have goosebumps. I have never heard of this. Are you kidding me? I literally just watched that. I was gonna pick that for this season. It's on Amazon. It's on 2B TV. <gasps> fucking watch it. Fucking love oh. it. This movie will get a hundred by one of us, I guarantee it. Is it is so fucking good. Something. I'm not wow. even gonna disguise it. I'm so excited. It is perfect. I was gonna pick this movie. It is Awesome. Oh my god, Paul, you're gonna fucking cum your pants. Like, they're gonna be crusty all it's the way down. It's so good, dude. John Stamos versus Gene Simmons as a hermaphroditic lounge singer, biker, gang warrior guy. Oh, I'm so excited. That is such a good pick. It was gonna be my next pick. Well, thank you for listening, B-Movie Maniacs and Movie Maniacs and just regular fucking maniacs. Check us out. Give us a uh, five-star review. I don't know how these things end. You're doing great. Jay, Mike, cover this for me. Okay, we have t-shirts and pants and uh, G-strings available <laughs> on our website. If you're cold or hot or just need clothes or you want to buy some clothes for people, you can look at it on mm -hmm. bmoviemania.com. You can also follow along with us on various social medias. Uh, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter. If a new hot thing comes out, fuck it, we'll join it. Who gives a shit? Yeah, and we we say <laughs> lots of stuff on social media that you may yeah, not like, hear on uh, the podcast. A good example is the one time that... Uh... Listen up, maniacs. Do you have a question or a comment? Would you like to uh, send some bourbon to Uncle Lloydy? You can contact the gang on Facebook at B Movie Mania. You can also drop them a line at bmoviemania.com. Reach out, touch them. They are touching themselves, and they might just reach back. I'm Lloyd Kaufman saying, see you next time on B Movie Mania. Woohoo! What's up? Here
here's my ch here's my ch challenge to you because I know that you have been uh, trying hard to get into the editing thing and yeah. you've been doing a great job. But here's my challenge you, to you. Yes. Edit this episode to under an hour. 